Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. You're going to have to wait for this one, Tom. Give it a little bit of patience, buddy. God, what is this, vaudeville days? <laughs> Trust me, it's worth it. Space, the final frontier. It's just Patrick Stewart. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's continuing mission to explore strange new worlds. To seek out new life and new civilizations. To boldly go where no one has gone before. Star Trek The Next Generation. We're trekking across the universe. John Luke, Picard, Data Wharf, and Troy. Dr. Crusher, Jordy LaForge. Star Trek The Next Generation. We're trying to see who gets there first. John Luke, Picard, Data Wharf, and Troy. <laughs> Dr. Crusher, Jordy LaForge. Right there they go in a big tin can. Give me warp five fast as you can. Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, it's frame rate. Oh, Welcome hey. to frame rate episode 78. I'm Tom Barrett. I'm Brian Brustrud, and this is young Robert Scoble singing the lyrics that nobody <laughs> knew they wanted from from Star Trek: The Next Generation. Uh, why are they Why are they racing to see who gets there first? That was the uh, only dude, part that really bothered me. There they go in their big tin can. The tin can, I get. As yeah, fast as you can. Uh huh. <laughs> ah, br- brilliant, brilliant. Well done. Well done. Apparently- Apparently that guy just, he's got like, that's all he does is he makes up lyrics for, for theme songs that you didn't know needed lyrics and probably didn't. Oh, well, but, I've made up lyrics to that song before, but never of that caliber. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, let's, let's just move on then, shall we? To the big story. This just in, the big story. Uh, wow, I was so stunned I forgot. It's episode 78 of Frame Rate. I'm Tom Merritt. He's Brian hey, Brushwood. I'm, I'm Brushwood. Sorry, dude. I didn't mean to shock you with that one. That's I know. A, that, it kind of threw me. Uh, so there's a, an article in the New York Times from last week by Brian Stelter uh, talking about what an MPVD is, a, uh, a multi-channel uh, video programming distributor, and how the FCC has actually started rethinking the definition of that word and even to the point of opening it up for public comment because specifically a Christian channel wants to carry discovery on their internet cable service. Now this is this is a, a service that's been around. They carry uh, specialty programming for folks who want Christian programming uh, and they uh, a few years ago they're called Sky Angel. A few okay. years ago they wanted to add discovery to the lineup. Discovery declined to allow it and they said, well, you can't. We're an MPVD. And under the, the rules of the U.S., there are certain... We've talked about must-carry rules before on this show, where right. a, a cable company must carry local channels unless that local channel releases them from that, and then they can negotiate for a fee, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a, a, a must-sell provision with lots of caveats, but essentially, uh, under certain conditions... A cable network has to offer their, their channel to anyone who's willing to pay a reasonable fee. Uh, so Sky Angel went to the FCC and says, hey, we're, we're, 
we're a cable distributor, just like Comcast, just like Time Warner. We just happen to distribute on the internet, but, but we're a cable, so Discovery needs to sell us this channel. Uh, they can't deny it. And Discovery is denying it not because they care about Sky Angel so much. They don't want to stream their channel on the internet yet anywhere. Right, right. Well, well, I mean, that would be damaging to their current advertisers, or, or at least they, they're afraid it would be. I mean, we've talked about this is a slow, painful transition as people figure out that eyeballs are eyeballs. So why should it be that all of our content is not free? Ah, uh, it's an emotion. There. So <laughs> rightly put it. <laughs> so, but here's the important thing is um, <clears throat> uh, why does the FCC have to be in the business of declaring – I mean, I guess it makes sense. There's, there's a legal framework, and you got to have somebody be in charge of, of making these kind of decisions. But it just kills me that the, the FCC is in charge of it to begin with, and that there's... Um, All right, I mean, put I, your libertarian gun back in its case. That's right. Cha-cha, pia cha No, I, uh, uh, I mean, I just don't understand why they're the... Uh, the I, I just don't understand it. How about that? Well, <laughs> what, what don't you understand? I mean, because I, I know you understand that the FCC has been put in charge of this sort of thing. Sure, sure. Well, and and I, I mean, it's great that they are updating the the current um, you know definitions for these things. I don't know how much of a legal framework sits underneath this. How big of a deal it is to structurally decide what what defines an MVPD and what uh, which, by the way, would be an awesome name for a hip hop group. MPPD. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The the it seems like it should be some city's police department. But uh like how big of a fundamental change would this be? I mean, obviously we're talking about the one case of it would re require people to sell their content to uh to to video, you know, over the top services, but um is that it or would this be more of a groundbreaking thing for for other things that we haven't no, even No, this this would be huge. This would be uh this would be a landmark if the FCC allows this to happen because essentially up till now if anybody wants to take a cable channel and stream it online they can't unless the cable channel wants to do it. And in fact, the other cable distributors like Comcast and Time Warner and Cablevision all want to restrict that sort of thing from happening because they don't want it to compete with their service. Right. But if the FCC which resisted this, by the way. When Sky Angel first petitioned them, they said, no, you can't do that. You're on the Internet. That's different. Right. We're not going to get into that. We're not going to regulate that. Uh, but Sky Angel pushed it enough that FCC decided to go ahead and open it up for comment. If they somehow did decide to do this, this means now, anybody can start a cable company. Now, and all the, of a sudden, you, you, can, you can have hundreds of options instead of the one or two or three, depending on how you count satellites. Now, the whole reason we have the FCC is because when uh, broadcast media started, um, I, it was with radio, right? They decided, uh, hey, it's not like print where anyone can print up anything using uh, you know, a printing press and there's a million different newspapers to choose from. There's only so much bandwidth on the radio. And because it's so scarce, we have to be in charge of handling this broadcast. And, and of course, you know, television was broadcast, same thing. And so they decided they're in charge of that as well. If they were to make this decision, does that all of a sudden broaden the reach of the FCC to where now it's in charge of deciding what kind of media goes on the Internet? And what does that mean as far as, uh, you know, the FCC has a reputation for, for being, you know, a nanny and deciding what words we're allowed to hear? That's a, that's a fair question, uh, but I don't think so. I think what this says is, is the Internet uh, – going to be considered as a conduit for cable television. It doesn't mean that the FCC can then say, and now we govern the entire internet. All it means is that the FCC can say, we now govern video streamed as a multi-channel provider on the internet, only because it happens to be on the internet. But we're not going to expand it to, to governing the whole internet. Now, what it could mean, though, that is more worrying, is not like, oh, well, now the FCC is going to go and start censoring the New York Times or, or they're going to go to my blog and tell me what to do. That's not going to happen. I'm 99% sure. But what well, could happen if they decided to approve this is Hulu and Netflix could fall under these sorts of uh, regulations because – if the FCC says, okay, well, video distributed over the Internet falls under these regulations, therefore Sky uh, Angel now has to be allowed to carry Discovery and, and stream it over the Internet. Uh, but that also means that anything else done on the Internet that looks like an MPVD or an MVPD uh, is, in fact, under these regulations. And Netflix, you look like that. Hulu, you look like that. YouTube, maybe, looks like that. Th those, that's where the question lies. 
Well, yeah, and uh, uh, you know, and at that point, I mean, why wouldn't why wouldn't certain porn channels, uh, certain porn sites, suddenly be under the be you know, can they just declare them an MPVD and then uh, and have jurisdiction over them as well? Well, yes, uh, c- cable has FCC doesn't get into content regulation much on cable. FCC right. gets into dis- distribution regulation on cable. So well, the I mean, fact that it, something's it, porn or not really wouldn't matter to the FCC in this case. FCC would say, are you sending video? Are you sending video in a way that makes you look like an MVPD? Then, okay, we're going to say that you now have the requirements and responsibilities, which would mean that your porn channel in some weird version of this might be required to carry your local government access. <laughs> See, this is, uh, this is but, uh, but, I, but again, I don't think it would go there, but, but it's a question, yeah. I mean, not immediately. This is the way these things happen is you get creep. You get you get a little bit at a time. And before you know it, they got, you know, it's it is the natural tendency for these things to grow and to seep their fingers and other stuff. Now, all of this is is not to necessarily say that I have opinion one way or another on whether or not they should declare, uh, you know, that 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 online services are an MPVD uh, It or wait, I just said MPVD. It's hard. Would, it's hard. <laughs> military police venereal <laughs> Uh, but the but the important thing is, and to be honest, they, they probably should. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna you know look at the world and say, yeah, clearly these are networks. Uh, they they happen to have a different kind of distribution. Half of them are on you know uh, uh, cable subscriber services for for the internet anyway. I don't see any reason if 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 Revision Three could be called a network and uh, that that does television content that just distributes online instead of over cable, then why can't why can't you have an over-the-top network? That well, I think to- I think what's going to happen, what's likely to happen, is not this nightmare scenario where where your 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 porn tubes of the world carry C-SPAN. Uh, I don't know no. if that's a nightmare or just some kind of be, weird dream. Or is it a sweet sweet dream? Tom? <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> something odd, whatever you want to call it. I don't C-SPAN. think that's going to happen. I think what happens is if the FCC decides. Okay, you know what? This does uh, this does in fact meet the uh, the requirements. We're now going to have to reevaluate uh, evaluate what qualifies as an MVPD and what doesn't. I think Congress immediately weighs in and amends the 1993 Act that created a lot of these regulations that the FCC is enforcing. And suddenly we have to reevaluate everything from the ground up. And actually, I think that could end up in the current climate being really nasty and do even worse things to the internet. Than the than than what happens right now. So uh, I'm not saying I want that. I am attracted to this idea of them saying, "Look, if you're car- if you're if you're com- if you're a Comcast competitor and you just happen to use the internet as your distribution mechanism, you should be allowed to do the same things Comcast does." But but you've you've rightly pointed out it opens up a whole other bag of worms. Um, yeah, this is this. Uh, my guess is this will not be the last we hear of it, and that my guess is the next round of press you're going to hear are all the complications that this introduces because it does open up, like you said, a nasty can of worms. And let's be clear: the FCC resisted this; they don't really want to do it, uh, and they recognize that it has broad implications. They're just taking public comments right now. They can take public comments and go, "Nope, doesn't qualify. Totally different thing. We're out." And and that would yeah, be what, that would be the know. end of it. I, there's something about that really annoys me as well, where it's just like, hey, man, we want to hear the public discourse and then well, completely <laughs> ignore it and do whatever we no, want. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying they may take the public comments and look at the public comments and go, no, there's, there's nothing in the public comments that's, that, that, is, that is persuasive. That, that could happen. The public could say, no, we don't want this. Right. That's, that's I, what I'm saying. I'm not saying they'll ignore the public. No, I know, but 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 they're under no obligation. I mean, being a, a independent bureaucracy, they're no, under no obligation for anyone. I mean, they they don't listen to public comments when it comes to. Well, you know, now you're just picking right? on them. You're saying, oh, you're taking public comments. Well, you're not going to listen to them. Let's let's, right. let's, let exactly. them, let's let them let's let them listen to them first. Okay, and find right. out what those public comments are before we just but go cut like their your legs off. Of the way I talk to the FCC. <laughs> Uh, uh, paid content also had a uh, panel last week called The Video Boom. And I thought this kind of went along nicely with this conversation about being an independent distributor on the Internet. Uh, there was a, uh, a guy named Brian Badel, uh, who's a cable industry veteran. He founded things like College Sports TV. He founded the channel that was sold to ESPN that became ESPN Classic. Uh, he was the first promo person at MTV. He's been around this for a long time. You might think, oh, God, industry veteran, dug his heels in. What is he saying? Well, he's now the CEO of something called Bedrocket Media Ventures. And he pointed out, look, to launch a cable channel right now, you need 
to become an MVPD under the current regulations. You need a satellite, you need a sales staff, and you're in the whole 50 to $100 million before you even know you have an audience. With YouTube, you can be distributed everywhere overnight, and you don't need to make these binary decisions. He's pointing out, look, if you've got video, make it and put it on the internet. Don't go to cable. Don't, don't go to the networks. Let's, let's distribute direct. Let's do an end around. Forget MVPDs. Forget the FCC. Let's just bring it right to the people. And this is an old, older industry veteran. I don't mean he's old. I just mean he's been around the game for a while. No, you meant he's old and wrinkly, <laughs> and therefore his opinion doesn't matter very much. That's not what I meant. <laughs> and you said disparaging things about MTV. Uh, no, look, at some point, the truth becomes so blindingly obvious that no matter what your vested interests are, no matter how long you've been playing the old game, the new game is is clear. And there is a <clears throat> level of, of, of seamless transition. You could go from zero to famous overnight, literally, thanks to the built-in worldwide distribution that you and your content and your video has. And he's, he's saying, look, original content is more valuable because right now, if you have an old library of content, a lot of it's not going to be relevant anymore. Some of it might be, but the rights issues and, and the clearing and the, the fight, it's not worth it. He's like, I'm not, I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, we have another fight going on between the cable industry and the broadcast industry and innovation. And you, everybody's on a different side in this one. It's another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Now, this has to do with that uh, Dish Network uh, feature that we talked about where the day after primetime airs. So they do this, this, this feature that records all of primetime on the four major broadcast channels here in the U.S. So everything in the primetime, I think it starts at 8 p.m. Eastern and then goes to 11 p.m., something like that. Uh, everything gets recorded so you don't miss anything ever. It's already there. The day after it's aired, not the same night, but the next day, you can choose to have all the commercials auto-deleted. As we expected, most of the major broadcast networks are suing. NBC, CBS, yeah, who, and Fox. Uh, who saw this one coming, Tom? That advertisers and <laughs> distributors didn't like the idea of people cutting out the one thing that makes their product and or service profitable. Who would have seen this coming? Yeah, so uh, essentially, Fox and NBC Universal, as well as CBS are suing Dish over what they're... This is called the Auto Hop Service. Uh, and they say, we're given no choice. Their wrong-headed decision requires us to take swift action. Consumers should be able to fairly choose for that. This, this is horrible for everyone. And, of course, Dish says, what are you talking about? Uh, we pay you. You, you. you opt out of must-carry, and you make Dish... You know, Dish just went with a fight over with AMC over, over this. You make us pay you... To carry your content. And now you don't want us to do what you want with it. The customer has to pay that cost. And you're saying the customer can't do what they want with the stuff they've recorded? Oh, no. So Dish has actually sued them proactively. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you what, it's uh, I'm really conflicted on this because I understand exactly where the networks are coming. And I even understand them saying we have no choice. We have to sue uh, because, uh, I mean, they, they got to be terrified, right? I mean, this is this is their bread and butter. Um, but uh, those, those are very good points. And the question is, I, I, I don't, I don't perceive that there should be anything illegal about it, but uh, weirdly, I just, I, I don't know how to feel about this because I'm on that weird fence as, as a, as a producer and as a consumer, as a consumer, I love it. I want it. I, I, I think that, uh, you want to go a step farther and make everything on demand instead of having to DVR it to get the commercials skipped. Uh, but, uh, but as a producer, um, if this becomes institutionalized, then um, I mean, is it? I, I I don't know what the end game is on this. I don't know if this would have an impact on the bottom line or not. My gut tells me that it probably would have to, but then I know a lot of things that seem intuitive turned out to be totally wrong. You know what's what I well, the reason I'm I'm on Dish's side for the most part in this one is because the networks are trying to use copyright law to enforce this. They're saying, oh well. You are violating our copyrights by changing uh, the things for people. And Dish points out, no, people have to choose to do this. Uh, our our auto hop feature isn't turned on by default. So if a customer gets up and doesn't watch a commercial, is that violating your copyright? If a customer records a, a show to the DVR and fast forwards, is that violating copyright? 
How is this different from the customer taking action to miss a commercial in any other way? And, of course, the broadcast networks are saying, because it's automatic. Because if a customer gets up and leaves, that commercial is still playing. We can't control that. We can control this. So it's all about control. Now, of course, if they had worked together, they might have found innovative solutions like, um, uh, let's say, a day after they're able to say, look, nobody wants to see your commercials. And if they're watching on DVR, they're just going to skip it. Why don't we come up with a compromise service where instead of, you know, two and a half minutes of ad break, you show one 30 second commercial and we auto substitute it for you and we'll track it. I mean, there, there, there's so many things that consumers would be OK with that are middle grounds for this, but nobody wants to talk. They just want to sue each other, which, again, I understand. I mean, you know, but uh, but it's well, a because That's the industry good. takes a hard line and it takes. It takes a big player like a dish to be able to stand up to them because the industry is like, no, you're going to show all the ads all the time. We, we gave in on fast forwarding on DVRs. We didn't sue TiVo, but we made sure that commercial skip button got taken away. So you can't just click right over them. You have to see the ad. And the reason right. for that is the ad companies have found that even when you're fast forwarding, some of the message still sinks in. So there's some value to that. Uh, I don't think copyright should be used in this way. No, uh, absolutely not. And I, I think don't think what Dish, I don't think what Dish is doing is illegal. Right. I, I, think- I agree with that 100%. Uh, however, I also still understand the frustration and the abject terror that all of the companies, uh, you know, uh, what, what is it, uh, NBC, Universal, and Fox? And CBS, yeah. Just those two? CBS. Uh, yeah, no, but, but, but I think you're right. I think they're picking the wrong angle to fight this on. And maybe it's the only angle they have because I don't think it's against the law. But what they have that they can do is not provide their content to Dish. Yeah, they're not going to do that. There's no way. Dish is how many how many millions of homes is Dish in? Oh, and you know what? This this will turn into one of those pissing matches where where it's like the We're local an MVPD. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The lo- local uh, uh, cable ads would be like, you know, do, do you want all your favorite Fox program to go away? Well, then pick up the phone and say some hateful crap to the folks over at Dish because they're being jerks in our negotiations. Have you have you ever seen any of those locally when when they're down to the wire? I I haven't no because I I have Direct TV and that so rarely happens in San Francisco. I but uh, yeah, I've seen I've seen those kinds of things done before. I, I may have seen one or two. Yeah, but yeah, no. it's this is and and let's be clear. Dish isn't doing this because they love you. Dish is doing this because they want another bargaining chip with these guys because they've gone through some recent ringers with various channels and they they want to they they're going to back off on this is my guess. They're going to go up to the brink and then they're going to say, "Well, if you give us some break on the carriage fees, then you know, we'll let you have a little more control over this auto hop feature. So you, do you think this auto hop is up for renegotiation? Do you think it's going away or do you think they're going to stick to it? Oh, no, I think it's going to stick to it. But but like you said, you know, a deal where it's replaced by a 30 second commercial or, you know, something like that. Those are cards they can have in their pocket or you, the auto hop feature won't work until three days later instead of one day. Late. You know, that kind of stuff they could easily do. And I think I think this is Dish saying, you know, we're tired of getting kicked around by you guys. So we're going to use our leverage. Uh, you won't have, you won't have Dish Network to kick around anymore. That's right. They're sitting there in the counselor's office, and then Dish is like, well, sometimes I act out because I feel like a third-rate provider, and so sometimes I do things that are outside of what's acceptable, like creating auto hop. Yeah, and I'm I, sorry. I am so sorry. You won't have Dish, Tricky Dish. <laughs> tricky uh, dish. Let's get, move to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. This is, this broke late, late last week. We talked about it on Tech News Today as well. Uh, a guy named Brian Kammerer made a campaign video for a friend of his who was running for mayor in Bexley, Ohio. Travis Irvine was running for mayor. And it was, it was a funny ad. It was intentionally, yeah. you know, tongue-in-cheek of him black and white... Uh, walking through the streets very patriotically uh, with a crazy song about, you know, a new face for a new pl- or a new place, whatever. I don't remember exactly how it went. Uh, but this was in 2007. In 2009, The Tonight Show ran the commercial as part of the, a funny video segment, funny campaign ads. And we should, Jay- we should- Point out that they do this kind of thing all the time. I mean, uh, they have entire segments where they just hop on and show uh, other people's content off of YouTube. And I don't know if they have some kind of handshake deal with the folks at YouTube or if it's just sort of 
you know, I know that's part of the reason that YouTube's uh, usage terms are so onerous is because they want to make it clear that when something goes viral and explodes, you know, it's going to show up in all kinds of places and you can't get bent out of shape about it. Well, uh, yeah, let's let's let, before we get to the implications of all of this, they took a bunch of commercials. They showed it on The Tonight Show. Uh, and they uh, and the guy the guys were were they were flattered they were glad that it was shown uh, and and they told their friends and they all called each other and they were excited and now they they bill themselves of having been on the Tonight Show which is a little bit of a stretch but okay their 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 stuff has been on the Tonight Show now this past week Camera noticed that the video had been pulled down off of YouTube and when he looked at it it said this video contains content from NBC Universal who has blocked on copyright grounds. Obviously, this is the robot. We've talked about this before. There's a robot that looks for matches and signature. So NBC regularly uploads their shows to this robot, and the robot looks around and says, if we see anything else with this show, anybody got a clip from The Office, anybody got a clip from 30 Rock, Saturday Night Live, we'll alert NBC, and they can decide whether to take it down or whether to actually uh, put ads on it. And NBC often takes it down. That's just the way they work. In this case... Well, getting back to what Brian was telling you, this was a video that was theirs that was used on The Tonight Show. And obviously, The Tonight Show's signature is being used to take it down. Right. So, back to your question. I mean, I mean really- The Tonight Show obviously has a fair use defense in, in, in using it in a commentary way that, that I, would, I would defend. But that doesn't give them the right to then upload that to the signature of YouTube and claim it as their own. Yeah, and it's like I'm in a, I'm in a weird space because if I could, like I, you know what I've wanted to do for years, and what I, what I'd love to do is a live show that's nothing but playing clips from YouTube. But it's such a legal nightmare, uh, you know. And because I'm a I'm a one man show that's got no leverage behind him, it makes everything very difficult. And even here on Frame Rate, we have to be careful about when we show certain videos, make sure to uh, to back them out uh, so that they don't get the automatic takedown and stuff. And it just annoys me. That uh, NBC Universal just comes across as such bullies that number one, they just grab the content and show it. And again, I understand that. I mean, if if what you want to do is have a show of popular commentary, but then to turn uh, turn around and be such hard asses about shutting down other people's content, borrowing your stuff, it's so one sided. And they just come across as, as the biggest jerks. Well, and what was funny about Cameron's post is he obviously understands how the robot works and he knows this wasn't intentional, but he writes it as if Jay Leno is personally responsible for having this video down. And he even says, look, I know there was a robot involved. I know how this YouTube thing works, but don't try to use that as an excuse. You, Jay Leno, run The Tonight Show. You are The Tonight Show. And you took my video down. Give me my video back. Right. No, and, and, and you're right. I mean, it's, if you got to have a buck stops here mentality, and it's like, look, if if not you, then who? Because somebody needs to do something about this, and it's and it's total BS that you guys are you know using my content without permission and then shutting me down for it. I you know, we, and this was the discussion we had on Tech News today because some people felt like, well, I get Cameron's point, but be, he's being kind of a jerk in this post yes, about it, right. and, and I'm jerk. not sure that helps him, but. I disagree. I think it does help him. I think what he's doing is saying, look, let's stop throwing up our hands and going, oh, well, that's the DMCA. Nobody, nobody's really responsible. Let's pin it on someone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I to be honest, um, uh, if you, you find a, a lawyer who wants to make himself an interesting case, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind this guy suing him over it because it's I mean, this is you do damage when when this kind of thing happens. I don't know if Jay Leno should be sued. Why not? Do you, you think Jay Leno? Because I don't think he's responsible for this. But oh, I, no, no, no. I, I, I'm actually saying sue uh, NBC Universal yeah, because okay, yeah. you know, and because you got a strong case. Like, look, you guys stole my content. You didn't tell me how to do it. You, you didn't tell me you're going to do it. You didn't even inform me. You use it and derived monetary benefit from your show. And then you turn around and you and it, it wasn't like you copied my content. You stole it. You now have it, and I don't have it. That's this is the one version of piracy that's true theft, and this should never happen. But this is what happens when the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is enforced as written. YouTube right, says, right. hey, we're out of this. We're, we're, we're safe harbor, and we don't want to lose that. And I don't blame YouTube for not wanting to lose that. So if NBC says that, then you have to do, do a counter notice. And I'm sure that Cameron applied for a counter notice. But Cameron's point is, I shouldn't have to go through all this to defend my own stuff when somebody else uses it without my permission. How come I can't have The Tonight Show take down their show because they've got my stuff in it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and and again, it's just a case where it's the big guy versus the small guy. They've got the lawyers. They've got the 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 dedicated YouTube representatives that uh, that they that they can pick up the phone and call and get a human being. It's like you know, I defy any normal average Joe to pick up the phone and get one person from YouTube anywhere. I, like they are openly hostile to any individual talking to another human at that organization. The only difference between NBC Universal and Camera here is if Camera wants to have The Tonight Show taken down off of YouTube, he has to file it manually. He can file a takedown notice and YouTube will take it down, but he has to do it manually, whereas NBC gets access to the robot. And I don't think Camera can get that access very easily. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. All right, uh, let's take a break. Thank our sponsor, Netflix.com. If you would like to stream all kinds of lovely things, television shows, movies, documentaries, uh, The Guild, uh, so there's web shows on there, you can do it all for one low monthly price. And for 30 days, that monthly price is nothing. Absolutely free. Netflix.com slash twit. Uh, again, we know a lot of you are already Netflix fans, so pass this URL around. You can watch Netflix on your game consoles, you can watch it on your tablets, you can watch it on your phones. What am I missing, Brian? Uh, your Xbox 360, your Nintendo Wii, your Android device, your, your Roku, computer. your, your Apple, uh, Apple yeah. TV. Your box uh, anyway, box. It's, it's all there. So go go check it out. Netflix.com slash twit. If you haven't tried it, try it for free for 30 days or, or hand, be, be a pal and just go write it down on a piece of paper. Print it out. Print it out nicely like a gift certificate. Like you thought of it and give it to someone. Netflix.com slash twit. We thank it for their support of frame rate. Hey, Brian, would you like to take a dip in the slipstream? Yes, I do. Not a ton going on in the slipstream. Uh, Amazon has added hundreds of Paramount movies to their Amazon Prime service. That's their kind of Netflix thing. But it also includes free shipping. So you don't get that with Netflix. See, I prefer uh, to think of it as it's you're buying the free shipping, but you get the Netflix service for free. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Amazon has got a ways to go until they have the catalog that Netflix has, but they're getting closer all the time. Uh, Paramount's uh, movies give them access to such hits as Mission Impossible 3, Breakfast at Tiffany's, Clear and Present Danger, Mean Girls. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we got an email. I don't think I put it in the list, but there was an email from somebody who uh, was looking for some movie. I'm trying to remember what it is. Couldn't find it anywhere. And then, like, as an afterthought, it was like, oh, yeah, Amazon Prime's around. And checked, and sure enough, there it was. Yeah. Uh, also, Roku and Dish have partnered on a foreign television streaming service. This, what? This, this is strange bedfellows here. Uh, it's a, a streaming-only service that will be sold to customers across the United States, regardless of whether they're subscribers of Dish or not. So that's the key, right? It's Dish partnering, but you don't have to be a Dish customer. And you'll be able to get a number of international packages, things like Brazilian, Arabic, Hindi, other foreign language content, uh, for as little as $5 a month, all the way up to $45 a month. Uh, and you have to spend at least $20 a month. So it's $5 a month for a pa certain type of channel, but then you have to get at least four of those kinds of packages. You know what? The more I think about it, this, the less of a weird bedfellows it seems like. Because you got uh, – they need a box that does the streaming and have the tech for that. And, uh, of course, you know, uh, Dish theoretically, being a satellite company, doesn't really – uh, deal in over over the top internet services, so you get Roku, and then on the flip side, Roku doesn't have the muscle or the or the bit or the contacts to get all these different channels all bundled up in one simple deal. Uh, yeah, no, it makes makes perfect sense. Does this mean that an MVPD is now delivering? Some of its content over the internet, Brian. Over the internet, yeah. No, this is – wow, man. Because like that, that's what's going on here is, is Dish is saying we've got all of these pay channels that we sell over Dish. All of these you – know, you, you see these on DirecTV. You see, them on, you see them on Comcast. You see them on Time Warner where it's like, oh, get the Jade package and you get all these Chinese language channels or get the Filipino channel. You just pay this much extra. So they're saying we've got access to all this stuff and those deals allow us – the flexibility to do this. So why not reach a whole new market without having to sign people up to the whole Dish service and make some money off it? Yeah, well, it seems like uh, like Dish is making a number of gutsy decisions for a uh, cable supplier, um, or I guess their satellite provider. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see all this stuff, to see which of these experiments pan out. And this is just a little step along the way to like, oh, if it works for foreign language stuff, Maybe some lesser-known, hungry, independent channels will want to do something like this domestically. Sure. Or maybe some English-language stuff. 
Like, like we'll get the Australian Broadcast Company and the BBC World Service, stuff like oh that. Oh, my gosh. No, I'd be down for that for sure. All right, let's move on to Tube Tops. I don't really love these rumors of an Apple Smart TV. <laughs> I was about to say, this is not, this is a very un-Tom Merritt selection to put in here, that it's just yet another rumor uh, in, the, in the great sea of them. What, what about this one made this step out for you? There, well, there just isn't a lot of set-top box news uh, this week, and it, uh, the combination of rumor, we're getting rumors from Digitimes, we're getting rumors from Han Hai, uh, the people who, who run Foxconn, who would be likely to build an Apple television. And now China's first financial daily uh, have unnamed inside sources, all of this stuff, uh, that Apple's plans to build an internet-connected TV set have taken another step forward uh, in that they are suggesting that Foxconn's Shenzhen plant received orders from Cupertino to build prototypes, to build a trial run of these things, which if, if if that were true, that would mean we're less than a year away from seeing this thing be released. Yeah, well, and uh, no talk about what size they are or any of the features or any of that stuff? No, we've had lots of rumors about that before. Uh, you know, most of the rumors run in the 30 to 40-inch range. Uh, most of them talk about voice-powered search. Uh, you know, there's all, there's all kinds of, of speculation about what they'll end up being. But more and more analysts have been saying we're going to see this thing by the end of the year. Uh, and so this is just kind of the straw that broke my rumor-resisting back broke your heart it's Strong like wow if china if china first financial daily is saying that foxconn is running a trial run and you know i mean let's say i give that 52 percent viability as a rumor uh and then you've got some some premier analysts saying yeah no all of our supply chain checks tell tell us that this is going to happen you've got digitime saying that you know tsmc has been making some parts for this sharp has been making some screens for this it just it starts to feel like there's enough rumors that something has to be true although i still don't know what that is all right well uh, is that vague enough for you uh, no, no, it's plenty vague, but it's like at this point, I mean, uh, it almost it would it would utterly shock me if if these weren't true at this point. We've been hearing it for so long, and if they weren't going to do it, it seems like they would have put out the fires by now. Because at some point, you st- it starts to be a liability when you have the whole world expecting something that you don't intend to do. So, I mean, I, I mean, I think you're right. I think it's uh, I think this year, by the end of this year, you'll at least see the announcement, if this, not the actual. Put it device. this way: there there have been rumors in the past about Apple making a digital camera. Those have been going on forever. They've pretty much fizzled out at this point. They they were pretty hot at certain points. There were rumors about them making a phone that didn't fizzle out because it turned out to be true. There were right. rumors about them making a tablet. Same thing. This feels more like the phone and the tablet rumors than it does the digital camera rumors. Apple making a television rumor has been around for a long time as well, and it used to feel like the camera rumor, and now it's changed. Right. Yeah. Okay, no, that's a good way. That's a very good way to put it. Uh, And some sad news in the world of not just set-top boxes, but controlling your set-top boxes. Uh, The inventor of the television remote control passed away at age 96, uh, so lived a, a long, long life. Eugene Polly. Uh, received an Emmy for the invention, uh, the Flashmatic, a revolutionary device that was absolutely harmless to humans and could <laughs> even shut off annoying commercials while the picture remained on the screen. He didn't get sued for that, though. Dude, look at the uh, – hold on. Let me, let me dig this up, this photo right here. Yeah, there it is right there. Take a look at that ad, man. That thing looked like a, a green laser. Looks like, a, looks like a hair dryer that you shoot at the – Yeah, at I this- know. Uh, it's, it, it worked by radio, his original model, worked by radio waves. And I, I was watching Mad Men this week, and he clicks a, the remote to turn off the television at one point. And I was like, a little taken, a, I'm like, that seems anachronistic. But <laughs> at, at 1955, they had remote control. It just was kind of expensive and not very widespread. But it oh, man, I remember, existed. I remember there was a there was an episode of um, man, the old black and white Dennis the Menace, uh, where he gets a hold of a remote control and turns it on for, through the other through the window to watch his neighbor's TV. It's like the, that's how novel it was at the time. Look at that thing, man! That's awesome. It's, it's a ray a, gun. Yeah, it's a gun. It's not a remote control. That's great. Yeah, ray gun oh <laughs> one right there. I love uh, it. Ray gun prime. <laughs> I. You know, well, God rest you, Eugene Polly. Uh, we will miss you, but thank you for bringing us the clicker. 
I, I didn't get a remote. We didn't get a remote control in the 80s in our house. What about, I don't know about what? you. Are you kidding me? No, I did. In fact, uh, you've heard me complain about uh, about how slow it is to change channels now that we've gone digital. Like uh, I had I had one where I mean, literally as fast as you could press it, it would go earlier than the 1980s. Yeah. 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 1986, 87. Oh, no, no. That's what I'm saying. We didn't get our remote control until the 80s. Oh, until I thought you said in the 80s. And I was like, how did you go through the whole thing? We got our first remote control along with our VCR. Wow. That's that's how I first experienced remote control. That's awesome. Um, infrared changed everything. Let's check film found. Our everybody likes to rip on the sci-fi network and call it SIFI because they change their spelling and say, oh, they don't even put any science fiction programming on anymore. Well, check this out. Defiance. Not only a television show coming to sci-fi, but an MMO from Tryon Worlds where the things that happen on the show will affect the game. Man, I'll tell you what. These are two big gambles, and uh, it's a big gamble to create uh, narrative fiction on television. It's a big gamble to create an MMO. And so to, to create two things like this tied together and hope that they're both a success, I am not optimistic about their odds, but I do commit. Godspeed, gentlemen. Go forth and try to rock. We have mentioned this on the show before because I remember this part of it. Uh, the characters end up stealing a gem and drive from the game's setting of San Francisco to a new setting where the show will take place in St. Louis. So when you play the game, you're going to be in San Francisco, but when you watch the show, that's taking place in St. Louis. Right. It, uh, it sounds, it's, a, it's a great idea. It's a great idea, but man, two big gambles tied together. The only way to really call it a success is if both the Venn diagram exactly matches. I don't, I don't know. That sounds rough. It does sound rough, but I'm glad somebody's trying it, and I'm glad Sci-Fi's backing it. Yeah. It's, oh, and uh, uh, from the chat room, they're pointing out that Tryon are the folks who made Rift, and the Rift, Rift is an excellent MMO. Yeah, so they know hurt. what they're doing. It's just no one's ever really tried this part of it. It's an immigrant drama, by the way. Uh, citizens of a new world are trying to rebuild, not just survive, but really live. So it's post-apocalyptic. You got me hooked. Yeah. And Tron Uprising is coming to the Disney Channel, and they've put their first episode online. It's actually coming to Disney XD. First, uh, first episode is up online for you to preview before the, the series premieres on June 7th. Do you care about this? Because I'm super stoked. I, yeah, you know what? I was, like, a little skeptical. Like, okay, so it's not Clue. It's Beck, and it's not, you know, all right, let's see what this is about. I watched about half of this episode before I had to turn it off because I, I was running late for something, but I didn't want to. I, it's got great animation. Uh, I, I like the uh, voice work, and uh, it seems like it's off to a good start. Yeah, stylistically, it reminds me a lot of um, uh, the, the second story from the Animatrix, the, the one that's the, all the prequel stuff. Sure. It, uh, I, like, I like the stylized look of it. It looks awesome. So check it out uh, online. Uh, we found it on Boing Boing, but if you go to search Disney XD, look for Tron Uprising, you should be able to find it. What do you say we check in on how well I'm doing oh in the summer God. movie draft? Yes. The uh, particular benchmark I would like to point out this week is that The Avengers is now the Best dollar per dollar spent in the draft. Oh, wow, really? Yep. Even though you spent $63 for it in the draft. I spent the most that anyone spent on any movie, and I am now number one to, the, to this point. We're not even halfway through. Is, is, is the Avengers on track to unseat either Titanic or Avatar for all-time ticket Ooh, sales? Good question. I don't know. It's at $523 million. Uh, And it's, it's still running strong. I, I mean, Domestic I gross. For months. I hope it sticks around for months more so I can go watch it several and several more times. Uh, domestic growth for Titanic was $658 million. Avatar was $760 million. So... $658? You're telling me that this doesn't have another $100 million in it? It I might. It might. It's going to be It's gonna be a stretch to catch Titanic, but it's possible. I don't think it's going to catch Avatar, though. Yeah, well, you got all the money in the world. But I'll tell you, I'm, I'm currently much more interested in the side bet that I made with Justin Robert Young... Uh, we bet a stake over. He was trashing my picks, saying that, uh, you know, I was pointing out that 
that I don't need uh, uh, by buying so many different movies. None of them have to be exceptional hits, but but the sum total of them, you know, would equal for the amount of money that you spent on Avengers. Uh, these four movies should do well. They've all had soft openings, and he bet me that uh, Dark Shadows plus The Dictator plus Battleship plus Men in Black, Black 3 would not make more than $357 million and 70 cents. And uh, so I'm, I'm eagerly hoping that MIB keeps uh, climbing ahead. It had $70 million opening weekend. So I hope it's got another another $100 million in it. I don't you know. know. Me- $70 million is nothing to sneeze at, you know, for, for a normal opening. However, I expected it to do a little better. I thought it'd be more in the 80 to 90 range. So um, yep. I think e- the Avengers too. is just crushing everything still. It really is. And it deserves to. The Avengers is a great movie. I don't think any of us expected it to be as good of a movie as it turned out to be or as popular a movie as it's turned out to be. Tensor Guy is leading the chat realm, by the way, with The Raven, Dark Shadows, <laughs> Battleship, which did $47 million, and The Avengers. All right. It should be pointed out, though. Wow, $650 million. That's pretty good. Uh, but the, the problem, uh, though, is we're early in the run, and so anyone who picked, like, The Dark Knight hasn't even had a chance to yeah, show Yeah, exactly. This the- is all going to change. And, in fact, uh, this weekend, Scott Johnson gets back into it. He's, he's number two because he had The Hunger Games. And Snow White and the Huntsman comes out this week. I Man, think I'm this stoked. is a it looks like a great movie. I can't wait to see it. It's a dark take on Snow White with Charlize Theron as uh, the uh, the witch, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. I don't know how many other people are though. Uh, no, I think I think there's lots of buzz. I think it's it's perfect because it's a, a property that you identify with children. So people, is it? It's not rated R or anything, is it? I mean, you're you're going to be able to take the kids to it. Oh, she's right? the evil queen, uh, Liz points out to me. Uh, not, not the witch, Shirley's there. But anyway, uh, I'm sorry. What were you saying, Brian? I, I, was saying, I was saying this is this is PG or PG-13, right? Like, you'll be able to take kids to it, right? I think it's PG-13. Okay, it's so pretty it's dark. PG-13. You're not going to take your youngins to this. Right, but you will take uh, somebody who remembers the old Snow White. Now they're in eighth grade or something. You'll take them. You, you'll, the chicks will want to go do it because you know they all love the Snow White, as Liz just pointed out. And then uh, and the dudes will be there for the action. This thing's this thing has all the makings of a sleeper hit. All right. Yep. So check it out, Snow White and the Huntsman. Uh, a couple weeks from now, Madagascar, Brian's last movie. Well, actually, no, second last movie. Uh, and uh, then Prometheus. Like two Two weeks from now as well. Very excited about Prometheus. Oh, my gosh. Prometheus, so good. In fact, that brings us to what we're watching. What we're watching. I watched Alien yesterday. What? The original? Yep. And does it hold up? Wow, does it hold up. Much more than I expected. I had forgotten almost all of it. It's been so long since I saw it. And... It was incredible to me, considering it's 1979 when this movie came out, how not 1979 it looks. I mean, yeah. there's certain elements of the, the film quality uh, and, and sort of those sorts of things, but it's not like the styles look particularly 80s. No, I'll tell you what, the set part of the reason that the 70s, I think, was such a golden age for science fiction is because the technology wasn't there to really do much electronically. So as a result, they had to every computer display is just an animation that they've put in there, uh, whereas just 10 years later, you look at science fiction from the 80s and it does not hold up well, because by that point we had we had crude 8-bit drawings that we were able to do on computers. And we thought that was nifty at the time. And now it's, it's just laughable. Uh, I'll tell you, man, I am crazy in love with 1970s science fiction. I, 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 I would highly recommend going and seeing Alien. I'm now debating whether I want to bother seeing Aliens because Prometheus oh isn't even a direct prequel. And, I, and I've seen that more recently, so I feel like, okay, I'm up to speed on that. Do I want to watch it in advance just for Prometheus? Because I watched Alien just in advance of Prometheus. Oh, no, look, watch Aliens because it's legitimately one of the best action movies, maybe the best action movie of all time. It has everything from beginning to end. It may be my all-time favorite movie. So you're going to watch it again? I'll watch it. I'm watching it right now. I have it open in the screen over here. You're constantly watching it in a loop. That's weird. Uh, So you, you, you haven't watched anything, huh? Uh, well, no, because you remember I, I I finished up Sons of Anarchy, so I didn't have something to keep on driving. Uh, we gathered the whole family around to watch Legend of Korra, and guess what? Rerun. It was the first episode again. You could have watched uh, Fringe. 
I should have. I should watch Fringe. The problem is that it's that, it, it, j that dollar commitment matters, though. It's like by the time, like by the time I was paying for episodes on Sons of Anarchy, it had its hooks all the way in, and I just didn't care. I'm still flirting. I'm still trying to get into Fringe, but it's hard for me to want to spend three dollars an episode when we're not. We're, when can you, you know, not just, watch it on a streaming that's not on a on a Hulu Plus or a? Uh, you or, know, I didn't check Hulu Plus, but but I guarantee you, Hulu Plus won't have the whole library in order. If I don't mind jumping around, but that's Netflix or anything like that. Yeah, I'll check on Netflix again. I don't, I don't think it's there, but uh, but I did watch Game of Thrones. Holy cow, holy cow! We got to talk about Game of Thrones in the spoilers. All right, yes, we definitely must talk about Game of Thrones because it was the Blackwater episode, battle episode. Uh, very interesting. I went and watched the Avengers again this weekend. Oh, I'm so jealous. I want to go see it. The problem is my eight-year-old daughter, like she doesn't, I'm trying to get her into it. I, I showed her Iron Man 2 and she thought it was just kind of dumb. She's like, why doesn't he wear the suit all the time? Why does he ever take it off? I don't get it. Why this would you just, ever take that? It's a good question, actually. Yeah, it is. Uh, I we, I, I, we were supposed to watch it Friday night. And I got home, and my wife uh, is like, um, I don't really want to go out. Can we watch The Avengers later this weekend? I'm like, sure. She's like, I rented Thor. Uh-huh. So we watched Thor again in preparation to go back and watch The Avengers in 3D, which we hadn't seen it in 3D, uh, on, on Saturday. Uh, now, is there any reason to watch it on 3D? Because I, like, I had to no. make that intentional choice when I first saw I couldn't imagine that it would be made any better with 3D. Now, and in both cases, you know, honestly, we just wanted to see it again. The first time we saw it, we saw it in 2D because that was the convenient time. And this time we saw it in 3D because that was the convenient time. It didn't hurt it. It wasn't like, oh, don't see it in 3D. Uh, right. But there was nothing that really stood out to me that said, oh, this part was really amazing in 3D. It's just I kind of forgot I was watching it in 3D, frankly. Hawkeye's arrow really looked like it was coming out of the screen. It right hit me in the face. I still have a scratch right here. I'm suing him. Uh, also, uh, Autopilot uh, is wrapping up uh, my other show with uh, Scott Johnson where we talk about pilot episodes. Sure. So I watched The Lost Pilot again. Oh, my gosh. Does it, ha does it hold up? It does. It holds up very well. Uh, it's like watching a movie. And J.J. Yeah. Abrams directed the pilot, so as you might expect. Uh, no. Roswell, I watched that. I'd never seen that show, so I watched the pilot of Roswell. And... The secret pilot of Life on Mars, the U.S. version. What, like, is that one that they scrubbed or they changed an actor or something? They changed all the actors but Jason O'Mara. Wow. Yeah. And, and, was and that the life? setting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I Life guess... on Mars is a BBC show that ran for a couple seasons and then had a, a sequel called Ashes to Ashes. They brought it to the U.S. They shot a pilot with Colm Meany as the, the chief of police. Uh, yeah. and uh, Rochelle Lefevre as the, the female lead, and Jason O'Mara as Sam Tyler, the main lead. And they set it in Los Angeles. And it, you know, it's, it's passable. But apparently it got panned by a lot of the critics. The, the network didn't like it. So they fired everyone but Jason O'Mara, moved it to New York so they could shoot it in New York and take advantage of some new tax credits there, and did it with Harvey Keitel and Gretchen Maul instead. I'll tell you what, if you want a, a similar total mind explosion, see if you can find the UK version of, um, of that 70s show. They, I think it was called like um, uh, something like those, those Were Days or some uh, The chat room will have it in two seconds. Pips and Fries or something. Yeah, I don't know. What's that? No, I don't know. I was just making up something. I mean, just, just type in UK version pilot that 70s show. It's unreal because the script is almost identical to the one in, uh, in the US, but all the actors are wrong, and it's painfully bad to watch. It was crazy. I wish I could talk Mad Men with you because uh, that would make a good spoiler zone after this week. But this week's Mad Men, brilliant and a, a big change in the Not going to lie. I actually, now that Mad Men was on Netflix, I told you last week I would check it out. I got as far as like loading up an episode. I was trying to remember where in the second season I was. Uh -huh. And I just was jumping around within an episode. And it's like guy with a box of chocolates, guy on a phone, guy talking to a girl in the corner, looking over his shoulder so people don't know what he's whispering. And like none of it. I, I just, I was just like, ugh, stupid soap opera. <laughs> and so, and so I'm, I'm still going to give it my, I'm still going to go for it and dive in. But I thought I would be more excited to go back to it than apparently I am. Well, you know what? I don't think it's for you. No, just, I'm going to like. keep trying. I like the first season okay. I just don't understand the fever that everyone has. Let's move on to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. 
This piece of feedback comes from A. Carl, who says to Framerate, I have a question about Netflix's new player that you mentioned recently. Does the new player use Silverlight? Last I heard, people were saying that Silverlight is on its way out. If Netflix is still using Silverlight, then they must still be thinking that Silverlight is going to be around for a while, or maybe they just don't have any other options. Just something interesting. Yeah, I think it's the latter, right? Because we had talked about this before. Uh, this is part of the reason that they want some kind of DRM in the HTML5 standard because uh, HTML5 would be a natural fit, but there's no way for them to enforce the DRM that even makes it possible to have the licensing rights that for the programming that they do. And, and, and when Microsoft says, you know, things about Silverlight, they're, they're never completely saying it's gone. They're just saying, oh, we're really behind HTML5 now. So Silverlight right. isn't being killed. It's not being taken out to the pasture and deleted from the Internet. Uh, right. it, and, and, and even things that Microsoft would like to die, like Internet Explorer 6, don't die. Uh, right. So, yeah, I think Silverlight's going to be around for quite a long while. It's just going to slowly fade out. And, and the main answer is what Brian said about the DRM. So Jeff writes us saying, I just wanted to thank you guys for reading my email about missing the Sherlock finale. I took, quote, Rabid Badger's advice, mm. which I thought was adorable that he put Rabid Badger's name in quotes there. Uh, check my PBS affiliate website, and there it was, watch online. I immediately clicked, and for the next 90 minutes, I was on the edge of my seat. Wow, 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 wow. And did I forget to mention, wow. Thank you guys so much. You made it possible for me to see this. I think I'm going to watch it again while I have the chance. Love the show, and cheers to the chat room, especially rabid badger thank you rabid badger you helped a brother out nice <laughs> uh chris from portland says for many live broadcasts nsfw show weird things i tend to use a browser add-on to download the original broadcast from the service provider justin tv in order to do this i have to click into the archive version first this gives justin and the streamer its click count and if initial ads are present they also get their play time am i stealing or harmlessly archiving Please keep in mind that I also download every episode when it is released. Learned that lesson from Game On. Rest in peace. Now, if I do this for, say, a streaming service offering mainstream TV shows, not Netflix or Hulu, but sites that encode and stream shows on their network, am I stealing? They have my click count, the ads are viewed and or counted, and I am not rebroadcasting anything. I think it falls to a DVR area, but I'd like to know what you guys think. Man, I don't even know. I, I, I mean, I guess let's start with what we can definitely talk about. Like, I'm okay with any archiving you want to do of anything that I'm involved with at all. And I think as far as Twit goes, all of our programming is based on coupon codes. So, so Twit derives a benefit when you watch the same show four times in a row uh, and it really cements that you need to use code, you know, frame rate seven or whatever to get uh, your discount. Then that's only good for us. However, going to Nick.com, and let's say, for example, it was a short window that Legend of Korra had the, the first episode up for free at Coronation.com. And if you did a screen grab or something and archived it and then had it, that would be smart because it was gone like the next day. And uh, I, I know that part of their agreements are that stuff's only available for certain windows because they want to be able to bring it back or, or sell exclusivity to another provider or sell it online and charge at some point. I, I, I don't know on where this is on the legal versus ethical thing. It seems, it seems like it's a, it's a minor offense. It's a venial sin, if anything. Well, you just described the ethical side, which is like, I feel like I'm doing the right thing when I feel like I'm doing this and that. The legal side, and I'm not a lawyer, is actually more clear-cut in these situations. Twit gives all of its stuff under a Creative Commons license. So as long as you're right. abiding by that license, you can do whatever you want with it. And this is allowed under the license. You're not repackaging it and making money and selling it to people. So that's fine. That's why we do it under a Creative Commons license. So you can do this and not worry and fear that the fact that you want to watch our stuff is somehow breaking the law. However, as far as things from Nick goes they may not have the same terms. And in fact, I know for a fact with Netflix and Hulu that there's DRM on these sites. And you are probably breaking the Digital Millennium Copyright Act by circumventing copyright uh, under most interpretations. Now, it, again, the law is less clear-cut because not all this stuff has been tried under case law. Uh, but my, my guess is that it's not allowed legally no. for you to do that. All right, hold on. Let's say let's say you're not circumventing. I guess you would be technically circumventing. How how is this not just a DVR type thing? So it's like you got a show because it's not a DVR. 
Well, I mean, I mean, uh, did Netflix it, or Hulu provide you a way to record this? No, 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 no. But I'm thinking of like, for example, uh, uh, the, the let's say the the coronation special, you know, where they show the first episode for free. That let's say it was known in advance that it would only be available that one day. And let's say you're not available for that one day, that one window that the program's being displayed for free. Uh, why couldn't you record it so you could time shift it to watch it later? And especially since. Apparently, there were scenes in that streamed version that weren't in the final released one for television. As long as you are not circumventing digital protection in order to do the recording, then that's fine. However, if you are circumventing copyright protection, you are breaking the law. Even if you have a fair use right, even if you have the same rights that you should have under a VCR or a DVR, if you are circumventing any kind of copyright protection to do it, you're breaking the law. Unless it's exempted by the Library of Congress. Laws be stupid. That's Laws sometimes be stupid. That's true. <laughs> all right. Greg writes us saying to frame rate. Hey, guys, what do you think about this? My wife and I recently moved to a neighborhood that has no major cable provider in the area. You can only get satellite and DSL. We're going we were going to take this opportunity to cut the cord and start anew. But after dealing with AT&T for a month and still no service, because apparently, quote, all the sockets in the area are full. We broke down and got direct TV so we could have some form of entertainment. We're thinking about going to our very nice and sweet elderly neighbor next door and proposing that if she would upgrade her service to the max level, we would pay the difference in her bill. I'd also offer my services for any technical issues she may have with her computer or anything else. Thanks for your time. Uh, it sounds like he switches gears here. Tell me if I'm reading this right, Tom. It sounds like he went ahead and got service for television, but he's talking about to take care of the internet side of things, getting, uh, getting, uh, basically setting up a land with their neighbor. Is that right? Um, yeah, this doesn't make any sense to me. Why so his neighbor could have service? Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm confused by the email. I'm not sure what he's asking. To be honest, well, it sounds okay. Let's let's discuss it as if the question is he got he got the uh, the satellite service and he's happy with that, but he needs internet service. AT and T won't give it to him because they say all the sockets are full. And he's thinking about going to his neighbor saying, look, let me upgrade you to the biggest internet package. We'll set up a Wi Fi router and I'll just use your internet. Um, uh, I, that sounds to me completely ethical and completely legal. Because if they're refusing to offer you the service, it seems like you you have no obligation to just be like, oh, gee, no internet for me. Well, if she wants to open her Wi-Fi network up, there's no law against that, right? Um, she's responsible for what you do on it, so she might want to take that into account if you're going to be torrenting stuff. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, if, it, if we're talking about her sharing her internet connection with you, then, yeah. I, I'm still a little bit baffled that AT&T can provide internet to your next door neighbor and not to you. Well, he said, he said, quote, all the sockets in the that's area. That's the part are that doesn't make any sense to me. So that's why I'm, I'm just like, okay, because I think I've, I've wheeled out that you're right. He's saying we got direct TV because we couldn't get the internet. We wanted to cut the cord and go on the internet, but AT&T can't bring us service. AT&T is messing with you. You need to ask for a supervisor. <laughs> Some, yeah. Something's not right there. Cause that, you need to escalate that business right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should be able to get internet service uh in fact that there's an in, there, the, they there may be some incumbent legal stuff on your side that if they can provide it in your area you, they got to sell it to you too yeah so, yeah i don't know i i tried to get dsl from pac bell in uh, 2000 and it took six to eight months i ended up going with earthlink because they just couldn't fulfill the order so weird wow. stuff like that happens sometimes but it shouldn't uh finally jonathan kelly writes, I am a cord cutter. I am getting a bonus from work at the end of this month, and I am going to buy a box. Is there any place where I can find a detailed comparison between the boxes? I'm currently jugging, juggling between a Logitech Review or a Roku XS. Uh, I actually don't have an opinion and don't know which of these would be better, but I thought it would be a great opportunity for us to introduce the idea of bringing on a guest to do regular segments about what kind of set-top boxes there were or some kind of tips for cutting the cord. If only we had some kind of secret machinations in underway to make that happen, Tom Merritt. Well, you know, Sarah Lane is an actual cord cutter, uh, and she she's always talking about different boxes and antennas and and stuff for, for cord cutting. Oh, my gosh. Wouldn't it be great if we could lean on her expertise on this issue and maybe drag her out from her busy schedule to come join us once and every so often here at Frame Rate to give us the tips and tricks of somebody who's actually cut the cord and made it to the other side? You know, I uh, 
there, we're, we're going to be juggling the schedule here at Twit. Uh, I bet. I bet if frame rate uh, could get an afternoon slot somehow, we could get Sarah to do that. Ah, uh, well, if only. What well, for now? It's just a, a fancy dream. It's not yet science fact. It's so fancy. Uh, I would say go with the Roku XS. Uh, the Logitech review is gotten has gotten a lot better, and I use it all the time. But it's still buggy, and the Roku XS is solid, uh, unless there is a particular feature like, I don't know, HBO Go is available on the Logitech Review from your provider, but not available from the Roku on your provider, as it is for me. HBO Go is on both, but DirecTV hasn't authorized the Roku to use HBO Go. They have authorized the Logitech Review for some stupid reason. So there's little things like that. Uh, I would just search around. Look, uh, CNET has some good uh, comparisons. I know The Verge has done some good comparisons. We've mentioned them on the show before, so check those out. All right, we're going to do a spoiler zone on Game of Thrones after the end of the show. So stick around for that. Uh, if you're not going to stick around, be sure to catch us in the morning, 10 a.m. A little no agenda reference. 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time at live.twit.tv on Tuesday mornings. And you can find us online all the time on demand at twit.tv slash fr. You can email us framerate at twit.tv. Thank you, Brian. So long, Tom. It's been real. Until the spoiler zone. We'll see you next time. Silent Green is people! So ladies and gentlemen, if you've stumbled into this part of the show, we are going to spoil Game of Thrones for you. If you do not wish to be spoiled, move away. By which we mean we're just going to, like, paint pictures that will distract you when you're watching it. And so it's like you won't be able to shake the things we've spoken about the show, and it'll just be spoiled. You won't be able to enjoy it anymore. Oh, you I like thought, it? See, I thought it meant we just left the episode out too long, and it needed to be put back in the fridge. And the next morning so we come out, and it's kind of greasy, and it smells a little. Maybe we, like, take maggots and sprinkle it all over the episode and just sort of festers for a while. Yeah. That's it. So we've spoiled Game of Thrones for you now. Well, we may have spoiled whatever you were eating. We haven't spoiled Game of Thrones. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about Game of Thrones. Put your fingers in your ears if you don't want to hear. It was Blackwater this week, uh, an entire episode devoted to the Battle of Blackwater, although it it took about almost halfway into the episode to get some action going. Uh, Yeah, but then again, it it did a great job of building up the tension. You know, this episode was written by George R. R. Martin. Did you know that? Yes, I did know that. Uh, And... Uh I don't think it showed in a good way. In other words, it wasn't like, oh, this one was so much better than... They have a good staff of writers, because this one, written by George R. R. Martin, was fantastic. Right. Uh, but it didn't well, stick out as being significantly different in tone. Well, and it's, it, it did a good job of reminding you that George R. R. Martin has a background in television, and yeah. he knows how to write for television. He, he was able to make significant changes. You know, they took out the chain that, of course, yeah. locked... Everybody in, uh, and instead opting for that awesome electric moment when they get ready for the naval showdown, and just one boat floats out completely unmanned. I mean, it's like uh, uh, those scenes. I, I, like, I don't think that was a scene in the book, right? That was a that was a purely television moment. I believe you are correct. I would not yeah. want to say for certain. Uh, my memory of of the details of a song of ice and fire uh, are unreliable. Well, especially since, like, that entire battle, the it way it's really. told from the position of, of uh, Tyrion, it, it intentionally is this mishmash of images of, of the, the chaos and idiocy of war at the time. So it's like, I don't, I don't blame either of us for not remembering. But how great was Tyrion's moment when, when Weasel Boy goes back and is like, oh, uh, sorry, my mom, she's got this thing. Uh, I guess she needs me for a second. You guys do, uh, do the battle fighting and uh, I'll be... Uh, be at my place is that cool like they do such a and then Tyrion's like wow nobody's leading these people totally steps up and kicks ass yeah i i i don't think anyone but george rr R. martin could have made sense out of what he wrote in the book and turned it into a television show it would have been quite different and and so you almost have to have martin write this episode to make it still have the same impact which i think it absolutely did you get yeah. The, uh, the surprise battle, you get the green fire, uh, you get the, the fact that Stannis is not going to be daunted by a little green fire, and he's still gonna, it's still going to be in question whether the city is saved. You get to see Tyrion's finest hour and him save the city 
and then not get any credit for it because that bit with Tywin Lannister was different from the book uh, as well. Tywin right. doesn't just ride up at the end and claim all the credit, but essentially it's as if he had, and so it's the same ending. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, the only, you know, another minor difference, and, and I knew this was coming. I knew that because it's a television medium, they weren't going to totally mess up Tyrion's face the way they did in the book. Because in the book, of course, you know, he takes that axe just dead center to the face, and he's got just the tiniest stub of nose left. Uh, but whereas this, it looks like, you know, it looks like he'll have a pencil thin scar across his face. For well, the I was next- wondering, I was looking at that. I'm like, come on, he has to lose the nose. He has to lose the nose. And then you see the, you see the cut and I'm like, has he lost it? And it's just no. sitting there or no, no, is it no. just a, gonna be a scratch? It's going to be a scratch. It's going to be a scratch on his face. And He's going to have and a it- scar there, right? Yep. Yep. yep Peter yep, Dinklage just- isn't going to go noseless. Nope. Nope, they won't. But uh, but again, uh, major kudos to these guys. They're they're just killing it over and over and over again. And I, I can't stop thinking about what it must be like for these actors who know they're onto something so special and so popular that this will be their life for the next decade. And then even after the show finishes, it will be their life. And it will be, you know, because a lot of these are relatively unknown actors before this project. Like, this is it and this is who they'll be for forever now. And, uh, and I can't help but think about... Um, who there's a lot of actors and there's no way all of them are going to still be in acting for the 10 years it's going to take to finish telling this story. And at some point they're going to have to replace actors with other characters or or characters with other actors. And I, I can't help. Maybe it's a morbid thing to think of. I'm not thinking necessarily of people dying, but just in general, you know, like uh, stuff happens, you know? Well, (laughs) yes, I was going to say the younger Actors are the ones that will have the toughest time. But if I start speculating on which younger actors are concerns and which aren't, then, of course, that's a spoiler of a different color. Uh, oh, but look, but it's, some, it's really, some it's young... It's spoiler zone. It's some, called the spoiler yeah, zone. Yeah, but there's spoiler zone and there's spoiler zone. We, spoiling the television show is fine. Spoiling ahead in the books, I, I, I want to shy away from. Because that's we haven't specifically warned on what all kinds of spoilers. But there are some young characters that obviously die in the future, and those you don't have to worry about. Um, others are still alive in book five, and, and those are the ones, by the time they get to season five or six, depending on, on whether they do one season per book, right. are going to start well, look not, a little we already know We already know that the next season, the, the next book's being split into, split into, into two, two seasons. seasons. Yeah, mm-hmm. which actually gives George a little longer to write book six. Oh, well, how about that? Hmm. Yes. I'm not sure if I like that, but you know what? He's not my employee. <laughs> yes, he is. He works for me and my <laughs> amusement. You write me the funny stories, sir. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, anything else to say? I mean, I, I was blown away. Uh, thought the Blackwater episode was absolutely fantastic. My expectations oh, I, uh, were high. I also loved the visualization of the wildfire. I didn't expect to find it so visually pleasing, but it's like there's something about the way they portray those green flames that was very aesthetically pleasing. I don't oh, know why. Also, Circe. Oh, wow. Great oh, performance yeah. Yeah. on how just utterly drunken bitchy she was. Oh, Sansa. sure. And that, that was that beautiful. Scene, uh, uh, with with her and uh, Tomlin, right at the very end, right before Tywin shows well, up, when she's on the throne with Tommen. I was thinking of when she was talking to Sansa. Yeah, no, sure, but, but both of those. But that, but that also, hurt. you're right when she's just spooky, weird with Tommen, like thinking she's dead. Well, and they do a good job of just giving you enough hints. Like, yes, yeah, she's a total bitch and a definitely terrible person, obsessed with power. But you get a sense of this episode of also how trapped she is and how. For us, how much she hates herself and her life that she's, the, the prison that she's trapped in. You know, the other thing, I want to give credit to the actor who plays Sansa, because that first season, I just wasn't sure that actor could ever turn it around to become the Sansa we're seeing come, become now. And she's yeah. doing a fantastic job. You see the spine beginning to grow in Sansa, well, uh, and she's which learning is incredible. to play the game. You know, she, she, it's, it's this unending game of chess all around her uh, for forever. Oh, how great How great was, uh, was the Hound's freak-out moment. When oh, yeah. he just throws his arms up, he's like, I'm out. Done. I'm very Hound-like. Very Sandor yeah. Clegane-like. Yes. All right. Uh, anything else? Nope. That's it, man. I, right. I wish, wish we had something to criticize about it, but they keep not nailing it, you know? I didn't like the way they handled Shay's part 
all the way. Really? You don't like Shay across the board? No, I love Shay. Uh, and in fact, I even liked Shay's part in Blackwater just fine. But if I had oh. to pick my least favorite, it's how they handled that. Oh, okay. Eh. But that's, I, I'm reaching. I'm reaching for a yeah. criticism there. <laughs> yeah, I can't, even, I can't even get fired up to respond on that. <laughs> All right, that's it uh, for spoilers. Though. Thanks, everybody, uh, for watching or listening to Frame Rate. We'll see you later.